Hey guys, welcome to GED Social Studies Level 2 Practice Test. So we have uh, four levels, and so that's really based on, um, which means there's four different practice tests. Uh, level 1 is the easiest, level 4 is the hardest. Um, and so those levels are really based on what's in our mobile app. So we have within the app uh, topics divided based on levels as well. Uh, so we have what I would do here is, and I will say this at the beginning of each of these uh, practice tests, is in the description are all 20 questions that are in this uh, practice test with the multiple choice options. So if you haven't done that already, I would go through those, answer the, those on your own, and then watch the video, see how you did, and make sure you're getting all the important concepts down before, before your exam. As far as evaluating you know, how good is good enough? Like what kind of score do you need? So you need a score of 145 on each of the four, uh, each of your four exams to get a GED. And so <clears throat> a 145 would mean like somewhere around 65%. Like that would be kind of like your cutoff line. But if you were thinking about college, then you'd be much more sort of like around that 75 or 80% range. So that should just kind of give you an idea and um, of where you are. So if if you're already there, like if you take this and you got 80 or 90 percent, great. Like you're looking pretty good on level two. I would jump to the you know next to the level three or level four, see how you do there. Uh, if you're doing well there, you're probably in good shape to go take the test. If you're not doing as well, you know you're down at 50 percent or you know even worse. Is um, we have specific videos if there are specific areas uh, that you're struggling and that's in the description as well and if you you know for people who need more help and there are you know a lot of people who we've helped with this is um, go uh, download our mobile app it's free download and start interacting with it it's really more fun uh, and interactive and engaging than listening to me um, and uh, that'll help you a lot because that's really how we get better is answering a lot of questions uh, it will customize all our short little videos for you, you know, so that it'll figure out as you're missing questions, which video it is that you need to watch, and it'll give you feedback for after every question. So uh, those are kind of your options uh, that we can offer you. Um, and having said all that, let's go ahead and get started with the test. Okay, 14th Amendment is the first question. So did the 14th Amendment in slavery give women, women the right to vote? Uh, give former slaves full voting power, promise equal rights and citizen citizenship to all born in America. Answer choice D. The 14th Amendment addressed citizenship rights in regard to issues involving former slaves following the American Civil War. Um, the 14th Amendment really is part of like the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, so they all tend to be grouped together, and they're collectively known as the Civil War Amendments, and they were designed to ensure equality for recently emancipated slaves. Uh, just for information's sake, because you kind of want to be familiar with all three of those amendments, uh, the 13th Amendment bans slavery and all inv involuntary servitude. 14th Amendment define a citizen as any person born in or naturalized in the U.S., which overturned Dred Scott versus Sanford uh, in 1857, which was a Supreme Court case, which stated that black people were not eligible for citizenship. So that's really the focus of the 14th Amendment. The 15th Amendment prohibited governments from denying U.S. Citizen, citizens the right to vote based on race, color, or past servitude. Okay, so that was a big answer. <clears throat> okay, the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854 called for popular sovereignty. Do we know what that means? Okay, so popular sovereignty, give me my pen back, means the settlers of each state would decide whether or not slavery is legal in that state. So to give a little more info, the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854 again called for popular sovereignty. The decision about slavery was to be made by the settlers. 
it would be decided by votes, or more exactly, which side had more votes counted by officials. At the heart of the conflict was the question of whether Kansas would allow or outlaw slavery and thus enter the Union as a slave state or a free, free state, right? So slave state versus free state, that was a very big deal in the middle of the 19th century. Kansas in the 1850s developed into a conflict between anti-slavery forces in the north and pro-slavery forces from the south over the issue of, you could guess, slavery in the United States. Which court case was an indirect catalyst for the American Civil War? Okay, so uh, you can be tested about really all of these, um, but we, I think we just referenced it in the last question. All right, so we wanna think, when we th are asked about court cases, Dred Scott and, sorry, can't write, Civil War. Civil War, Dred Scott. We want to be able to connect those two. So the Dred Scott case ruled that a Negro, as it was stated in those days, whether enslaved or free, could not be an American citizen and therefore had no standing to sue in federal court. It also stated that the federal government had no power to regulate slavery in the federal territories. The ruling really led to significant dissent from anti-slavery elements in the North and indirectly led to the Civil War. Uh, Marbury versus Madison was about judicial review. So if you just know that, Marbury Madison is about judicial review. Gibbons versus Ogden was concerned with interstate commerce. I would be very surprised that you were tested on Gibbons versus Ogden, kind of like this question. It might be an answer choice, but the likelihood that you have to know about it uh, is pretty unlikely. Uh, Emancipation Proclamation was an executive order issued by President Abraham Lincoln with the purpose of changing the federal legal status of more than 3 million enslaved people in the designated areas of the South from slave to free, it was not a court case. Okay, so knowing that Emancipation Proclamation is not a court case, and so you should be able to eliminate that answer immediately. Okay, westward expansion, right? another big, big concept that you're likely to be tested on. Um, so westward expansion was aided by all the following except and we will go with answer choice C on this one, the Monroe Doctrine. So going from top to bottom here, uh, the Louisiana Purchase took place in 1803. You don't need to know the year. In general, it would be nice to know that it was early in the 19th century. But what you really want to know is that the Louisiana Purchase doubled the size of the country. By 1840, almost 7 million Americans had migrated westward. Um, so Louisiana Purchase, definitely a big part of westward expansion. Homestead Act became law in 1862. The Homestead Act provided 160 acres of unoccupied land to settlers if they improved the land and lived there for five years. So that's just amazing, right? If you think about that now, you're offered 160 acres of federal land just to take care of it for five years, and then it was yours with no cost. Um, the first transcontinental railroad connected the Pacific Coast at San Francisco Bay with the existing eastern U.S. railroads. This established a transportation network that enhanced the economy of both the western states and territories, as well as the whole country. And finally, we get to what the actual correct answer was. The Monroe Doctrine warned European nations that the U.S. would not tolerate further colonization and had nothing to do with western expansion. Five. Question five. Um, following the Civil War, many Southern states in 1865 and 1866 successfully enacted a series of laws known as, and then we have these uh, answer choices. And so with this one, we want to be familiar with what 
our black codes. At the end of uh, May 1865, President Andrew Johnson announced his plans for reconstruction, which was which reflected his firm belief in states' rights. Many southern states in 1865 and 66 successfully enforced a series of laws known as Black Codes, which were designed to restrict freed black activity, ensure their availability as a labor force, right? So trying to keep them into similar positions that they had previously been in when they were slaves. Uh, these repressive codes enraged many in the North. Reconstruction is the period from 65 through 77, 1865 through 1877, in which the South was rebuilt. The Freedmen's Bureau was an organization charged with assisting refugees and freed slaves. Okay, so tricky question, and not easy to guess at any of them, uh, but definitely you want to know what Reconstruction was, but black codes, very important concept, very likely to show up. A major result of the Industrial Revolution was, okay, so as you look at these answer choices, we will go with this guy right here, right? So as the Industrial Revolution picks up speed, uh, you have a lot more people moving from rural areas to urban areas. So they're moving to bigger cities. Um, because that's where all the factories were, right? So for fairly simple concept, um, but that's really what you see, and that is the big result of the Industrial Revolution, besides the innovation. Um, and certainly among these answer choices, you want to be familiar with the idea that uh, all of a sudden a lot more people live in urban areas. Which of the following was not a part of the Industrial Revolution in the 19th century? Okay, so we have the steam engine, the assembly line, the textile industry, the iron industry. And the big part here is to make sure that you read 19th century. Okay, so the assembly line, which uh, Henry Ford really made famous, is a 20th century invent innovation. Um, the textile industry in particular was transformed by industrial industrialization before uh, mechanization and factories textiles were made really primarily in people's homes uh, developments in the iron industry also played a very important role in the industrial evolution in the 1850s british engineer henry bessemer developed the first inexpensive process for mass producing steel. I don't think you need to know his name necessarily, um, but just knowing that during that time period, that's when the first mass produced steel showed up. Both iron and steel became essential materials used to make everything from like appliances to tools to machines. Um, ships, buildings, infrastructure, right? that's all steel. Uh, and then finally, the steam engine uh, was an integral to industrialization and went on to power machinery, locomotives, and ships. So really, we're thinking more probably about ships than cars, you know, because it's the 19th century. Uh, cars are not mass-produced yet. <clears throat> what was one of the ideals held by the progressive era? era? Okay, so just having some real basic knowledge of the progressive era, era it focuses on fairness the progressive era was a period of widespread social activism and political reform across the u.s uh from like late in the 19th century like 1890s probably until the 1920s or so the main objective of the progressive movement uh, was eliminating problems caused by industrialization, urbanization, immigration, and corruption in government. So really, as we're getting into these, uh, the progressive era, what we want to be thinking are antitrust laws. And so the examples of those are the Sherman Act of 1890. I think that's probably the one that you would be most likely to be tested on, right? Is so if, you know, when you think progressive era, we want to be thinking antitrust laws. Um, 
Others could possibly include prohibition or the women's suffrage movement. But uh, what we'd really like to focus in on, antitrust laws, Sherman Act. That's what we really would connect with the progressive era. To the following is not a benefit associated with joining a union. Okay, better pay, safer working conditions, shorter work week, more collaborative work environment. This is an easier one. So we'd hope that you could see that it was, <clears throat> it's not more collaborative, but you do have uh, better pay, some control over what the work week is and how it's defined and uh, certainly safer working conditions. Unionized workers experience less of a sense of partnership and trust with their supervisors. So that is definitely a downside of unions. However, unions do provide their members with uh, better pay, safer, safer working conditions, and a shorter work week. The work of unions in the late 1800s and early 1900s led to the eight-hour uh, work day and five-day work week, which prior to that was really not the standard. So, it is, I mean, in that way, it's certainly very important. <clears throat> After 1860, the U.S. began to change to what type of economy? Okay, so we'd like to know that, right, so before 1860, it was much more agricultural. And after 1860, it became much more industrial. Many of the new industrial workers came from American farms. Young men went to towns and cities to look for an easier and better way of life. Many of them found it in the factories, which led to this new uh, industrial economy. Okay, and then we get into some politics type stuff. So an event that narrows the field of candidates is a primary election, right? So the primary election is, you know, so for example, you have, you know, five Democrats uh, all trying to get the Democratic nomination for president, right? And it gets needs to get narrowed down to one. Those are aspects that are involved in the primary election. The general election, when it's, you know, one Republican typically versus one Democrat, that is the general election. A caucus is a meeting of supporters or members of a specific political party or movement. In the U.S., a political convention usually refers to a presidential nominating convention. Political campaigns rely on which of the following in order to alter their campaign messages to voters. Okay, so how do they get information about what to put in their marketing material, what to put in their commercials and ads. And what you see there is opinion polls. Okay, so exit polls are after you've voted, right? So after people have already voted, that information might help them for the next election. But as far as actually altering campaign messages, it's much more based on opinion polls, like what do you like about this presidential candidate? Um, or Senate can senator candidate, whatever the case might be, um, right? Opinion polls are really going to have much more to do uh, with how messages are altered. Uh, the main point of a super PAC is to provide campaign contributions, so it's for money. Television ads send the campaign message once it has been altered. Okay, so we kind of just led into this with the last question, but what do PACs, right? And that those PACs, that stands for Political Action Committees do, uh, make ads, offer advice, uh, provide political reform initiatives, raise money. Okay, so PACs are all about money, right? Political campaigns cost a lot of money. Uh, PACs are definitely uh, controversial as far as what level of impact they should be allowed to have. But PACs raise money for political candidates. 
there are some restrictions in regard to the size um, of contributions allowed, but that is, the PACs are all about raising money. So when you see PACs, you want to think money. <clears throat> okay, so we get into rights of citizenship. Where do we find those? Um, and so our answer, the basic rights of citizenship, has the word rights right in it, doesn't it? Bill of Rights. So the rights of citizenship are stated in the Constitution. Um, so if the Constitution had been in here, that would have made it trickier. But specifically, it's stated in the Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights explicitly states that citizens have the right to vote, hold public office, and elect representatives. Okay, we got a foreigner question. A foreigner who has established permanent residence in the United States is, okay, then we have these different alien terms, right? A legal alien, enemy a alien, resident alien, non-resident alien. Okay, so it's kind of what it sounds like, you know, in this case, which they have permanent residence, right? Residence, and this person is a resident alien. Resident aliens have established permanent residence in the U.S. Going over each of these terms here, just really briefly. That's all you need to know is real briefly. A non-resident alien is a foreigner who is visiting for a brief defined time period. An illegal alien comes to the U.S. without legal documentation. An enemy alien is a foreigner who is a citizen of a nation at war with the United States. Right, so enemy alien is definitely the least common of the four options there. Okay, French Revolution. French Revolution led to all of the following except uh, the end of monarchy in France. French Revolution led to that. France establishing a republic. That happened because of the French Revolution. Uh, shaping of modern nations. Yes, I would say that's true. Fall of Napoleon. No. So some info on French Revolution. It began in 1789. You might want to note how close that is to uh, the U.S. zone battle for independence, right? Only, you know, 13 years later. Uh, and it ended in the late 1790s with the ascent of Napoleon. French Revolution uprooted institutions such as absolute monarchy and the feudal system. France established a republic, and many future nations were influenced by the will of the people. Right? So this is really a big time for the world, right? uh, both with the uh, U.S. becoming its own country, right? And the French Revolution. Those are both, you know, big moments for the will of the people and hopes for democracy. What was the result of the 1918 Treaty of Versailles? So I don't know if you guys have taken the level one practice test, but the Treaty of Versailles shows up there as well. So the fact that it's shown up both in level one and level two should suggest to us like there's a pretty good chance this question shows up on the test, right? Maybe not this exact question, but knowing what was the Treaty of Versailles, right? The Treaty of Versailles ended World War One and led to Germany having to pay reparations to the Allies. Right? It basically is just saying that Germany was at fault for the war and had to pay reparations. Okay, World War II, the Allies were made up of the big three, right? And the big three were the U.S., the U.K., and the Soviet Union. The Axis grew out of the diplomatic efforts of Germany, Italy, and Japan to secure their own specific expansion interests in the 1930s. The Allies were the countries that together opposed the Axis powers during World War II. And again, so those Allied countries were Great Britain, Soviet Union, 
and the U.S. Okay, and a question about American colonists. Uh, no taxation without representation, right? What is that trying to convey? Okay, and the nature of no taxation without representation was to say that any laws passed by British Parliament affecting the colonies were illegal under the Bill of Rights. Many individuals residing in what were the 13 colonies believed that as they were not directly represented in the distant British Parliament, any laws it passed affecting the colonists, such as the Sugar Act or the Stamp Act, were illegal under the Bill of Rights 1689 and were a denial of their rights as Englishmen. So this is a really a big part of America becoming a country on its own and not a part of not a part of Britain. And then finally, <clears throat> Adolf Hitler. And so again, there was a Hitler question in level one. Now we have a Hitler question in level two practice test. So chances, uh, that, you know, you want to know some basic stuff about Hitler. Um, pretty high that pretty high chance it's going to show up. Uh, when he became the leader of the Nazi party, he appealed to many Germans due to his military background, German nationalism, his promise to improve employment levels. Right? And so <clears throat> employment levels and the economy were big deals. Nationalism, also big deals. So our answer choice is actually D here. Um, right, so he... Uh, he appealed to them due to nationalism, promised to get people back to work, right? Those are two really big points for Adolf Hitler. Uh, okay, and so that gets us to the end of level two in our 20 questions. So uh, hopefully you did great, um, or if not, hopefully we're learning a bunch of stuff that we can uh, use to help us get through this uh, GED process. Uh, feel free to leave any comments about uh, things that, uh, need clarification or didn't quite make sense to you and we'll definitely respond um, <clears throat> and for more practice again even though I'm kind of repeating myself here uh, highly recommend uh, downloading the app uh, check it out it's free to download and I think it'll be very helpful